Bienvenidos, welcome everybody, and uh, here we have another transmission of the Palomazos. In English, it is something like a jam session, where we have a special guest, uh, writers, artists, uh, people who is involved in the storytelling. And I am really glad to, to welcome, uh, I can say that he's one of our recurring guests, something that I really appreciate, and I really love the work that he's doing, in, in particular in books and comic books. And allow me to introduce you, Mark Russell. How are you doing, Mark? Doing good. Doing good. Thanks for having me on again. I think this is uh, appearance number three. Yes, uh, in Churros y Palomitas, in this particular show, is the second appearance, but we have also another interview about some of other of uh, uh, your books at Destripando, which is only focused on uh, comic books. But yes, this is the third uh, occasion that we are in, in, in total. So I believe that a lot of things have happened since the last time that we had the pleasure of talk. And particularly, uh, you have been working in some other um, comic books, I remember that uh, first uh, we mentioned that it will be really wonderful to talk about Second Coming. And well, it changed uh, from one place where it was going to be published. But luckily, we have it right now in, in Ahoy Comics. So first of all, and uh, I know that I believe that a lot of people have asked you this question uh, in, in some other interviews. But how do you feel uh, about uh, finally getting uh, Second Coming, which is going to be by its third issue? in Ahoy Comics. How do you feel uh, for it being published right now? Well, I feel validated. I feel like it's uh, vindicated because I, I felt for so long um, the only people that were talking about the comic were people who hadn't read it. And I think it allowed the sort of professional outrage industry to sort of control the narrative about the comic and to make up whatever they wanted to about the comic and to talk about how it was, uh, you know, their imagination of, of, of how blasphemous or how anti-Christian it was. And now that it's actually out in stores, people can kind of see for themselves that, that everything that they were told by the, the outrage industry was completely untrue and uh, the comic can speak for itself. So I feel really good, uh, A, about the fact that it's finally out and people can read it for themselves. And also that it, just the reception it's gotten, it's just been floored by how many people have contacted me and told me how much they loved it. We're and we're even publishing like letters that people have sent into Ahoy in the back of the comic now. And and I told um I told Tom Pyre the uh, the editor is like I, I don't want just the positive letters. I want it to be a, a an accurate reflection of how people are reacting to the comic, good or bad. And he said, well, so far all we've gotten are good letters. So I I don't know if uh, that's just because people who were outraged. Just uh, I, like seeing the comic itself, like picks on the window out of their sails, or if they were never really that outraged to begin with, they're just more outraged by the idea that somebody would do this comic and not really about what the comic said itself. Yeah, and it's kind of funny because uh, originally, uh, just for uh, some context for the people who we, uh, who are watching us right now, it was going to be originally published by DC Comics and uh, uh, under the Vertigo, um, the Vertigo seal. And uh, it was, uh, I, I believe that uh, Vertigo is one of the, the, the brands, uh, we actually can, can say that it's a brand, that a lot, a lot of comic book readers, and not only comic book readers, but uh, have a lot of appreciation because it's uh, it was focused in uh, <laughs> in stories for mature readers. And for example, it was like a natural host, I believe, for this kind of story. And they had uh, published uh, before stories that uh, were way more controversial. I mean, uh, we can go back to yeah. Pitcher, which right now it's a, a, a TV show, actually. But for example, uh, for a, a lot of us, it, it came as a surprise when they decided to cancel. Obviously, after that, uh, pretty much all of Vertigo or pretty much all in DC Comics just uh, suffered some change. So it was like, well, perhaps the, the house that it was going to be in, uh, published into wasn't going to be there by the time that it, it actually got uh, into printing. But well, uh, at the end, I believe that I am really, we all are really glad that it's actually being published in, and also in Ahoy Comics. So. Yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I mean, I, I feel bad that Vertigo is shuttered because so many amazing comics have come out of the Vertigo imprint. They, they, they have such a large footprint in my own sort of comic book reading history. And I'm sure many others with titles like Preacher and Sandman. Uh, so it was really sad to see them go, but I felt like really that was just sort of the last nail in the coffin. I felt like they really started dying when they tried, when they started shying away from 
these sort of controversial topics. When they started telling us that we had to rein it in or, or um, not use certain words or, or, you know, try to fig leaf sometimes literally uh, passages from the Bible that were reflected in the, uh, in the comic, that's kind of why I felt like that to me, that was really the end of vertigo because this is, if you're not there to take chances, then why, why bother with having a, an imprint like vertigo, which is, exists solely to, to do these comics that you couldn't do anywhere else. Exactly. And uh, one, one positive thing that uh, I believe has happened is that the industry has changed a lot. And also, for example, uh, before Vertigo, it was really kind of uh, it, it was really hard to find a particular publisher uh, where you could uh, get this in the United States or in our continent, in, in, in the entire America. Uh, in Europe, perhaps it was more common to find, uh, especially for uh, single issues or for for um, for books, for complete uh, issues, not not just uh, like a regular series. However, right now we have, uh, well, Image was, uh, the, the, they began in the 90s, but actually you find a lot of titles like Sex Criminals, for example, that or, um, uh, well, uh, different, different titles that perhaps uh, you couldn't find at the moment if it if they weren't uh, published on, on on vertigo and right now actually we had the chance to talk with alan robinson last week uh, he's uh, the, the 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 artist for planet of the nerds and we have actually the the, the chance to to speak with uh, tom Payer himself before and uh, how do you feel uh, in ahoy comics do you think that uh, well they have a, a lot of uh, different comics that they are publishing but uh, how does how do how does second comic fit into the ahoy family to put it in one way well, if there is a, a silver lining to Vertigo sort of closing its doors, it's that it gives uh, brands like Ahoy more of a reason to exist. It makes them that much more necessary. And they certainly were more necessary for me and for um, Second Coming because they they not only gave us a home when uh, Vertigo was, was shying away from what we were doing, but they, they were really committed to doing it right. They really wanted to make it true to the original vision. And uh, I don't want to demean any of the work that they did on Vertigo because the, I thought the work the editors and everyone did on, at Vertigo was stellar on Second Coming. But I felt like Ahoy made it a better comic than it would have been otherwise because they let us really do, really go deep in what we wanted to do. And they didn't make the, um, the story be subject to the medium. They allowed us to put eight extra pages into issue one, make it 30 pages long, which really allowed me to flesh out the story. And, and make the statement that I wanted to make with the first issue. So they really are committed to the bottom line of not necessarily profit, but to making this the best comic it can possibly be. And to that, I am forever grateful to Ahoy. And I think that's really what the comic industry needs now. It's like more labels that are just about making the best comics they can make and aren't you know trying to sell uh, Batman lunch boxes on the side. <laughs> yeah. And uh, for example, let, let's talk. Well, uh, this section was actually to just in case that Tom Payer was watching, so we have to speak <laughs> good about the Howie. Uh, but for example, let's talk right now about the comic. Uh, the, the premise, in case that uh, some of the people in here hasn't been in touch, uh, ha hasn't been in contact with the, the basic premise of uh, second comic, is that we have an archetypic uh, character that is uh, pretty much like a Superman like. Uh, character uh, who is going to be a teammate with with some other important figure in 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 in, in the general culture, which is Jesus Christ. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about um, the perspective or the, uh, the 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 focus that you want to give to this story when when where you are pairing these kind of characters? Well, one thing that's always bothered me about traditional superhero comics is that they they are. You know, in, in essence, a meditation on power. But when the, you're talking about people with superpowers, the embedded assumption is that it, that that the violence is ultimately what solves the problem. No matter how noble Batman or Superman or Captain America might be, ultimately it's their violence that carries their day. And what what makes them right is the fact that they're they're, they're just able to to kick the bad guy's ass. Uh, and so I want to do a deeper meditation on power that usually gets ignored by superhero comics. I thought I needed a counterpoint to discuss, you know, whether or not power is always the best means for solving, you know, the problems that we go through. So I, I thought, who better than to bring in Jesus Christ into the equation, somebody who preaches empathy and, and, and understanding and, and healing as a method of, uh, of dealing with our problems. 
as opposed to just overpowering them with physical violence. So it's really about that dichotomy about whether or not um, the traditional overpowering with violent solutions that we've been spoon fed through superhero comics. And then we're very relevant when, you know, superhero comics came about in the 1940s when we were trying to save the world from fascism from, from, from Hitler. And I guess now we're still trying to save the world from fascism, but we're not doing it with tanks. We're not doing it with bazookas and machine guns. Uh, we're doing it with trying to build institutions that, that deal with people's needs. And I think that you, someone in comics, uh, even in superhero comics, needs to be the spokesman for that other approach, because violence is uh, really only capable of, in, of solving an increasingly small percentage of human problems. And it's interesting because usually, uh, obviously, it's kind of hard to sell a story when you uh, want to focus in more human aspects. Uh, for example, we can see it at the movies or at TV, at TV shows. Usually, if it's a summer season, you rather watch something that is uh, action-filled, action-packed. And uh, if it's going to be like a drama, like uh, something like an art film, if uh, you want to use that term, uh, where pretty much you have uh, about two hours of characters having inner reflections and, and uh, having a commentary about the, the current society, to, to put it in one way, uh, it might seem boring. But for example, I remember that in the first movie of Guardians of the Galaxy, there was one moment that for me was really great. And then for at least for me, it became a missing opportunity when you have the final uh, conflict with the villain of the of the movie. And then you see that the hero decided to do a, a dancing contest, a dancing fight. And for me, it was like, okay, how refreshing, because you are not recurring actually to violence, but you want to fix it in, in some other way. And at the end, well, it was just a distraction. And for me, it was like, oh, come on, that was just a missed opportunity. So in this case, we have the character, going back to the comic, of Jesus Christ, who is doing a lot of observation. And for example, we have been looking at some of the pages of, of the first Jesus, And I really love the, the 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 parallel stories that you are giving us in the, in this way, obviously with the with the the art of uh, Richard Pace and, and and the rest of the team, where we are actually comparing these kind of archetypical figures. And and can you tell us a little bit about uh, how this confrontation comes? Because in this case, in the art uh, that we're looking in here, uh, you have a uh, the perfect character uh, by the current medium, the the superhero, the strong uh, the strong guy, and then you uh, are confronting him with uh, something of a more uh, Um, um, correct issue, uh, a correct picture of Jesus Christ, which is not the blonde tall guy, but something more like a, a, a you of his time. So can, can can you tell us a little bit about, about the perspectives that they are both uh, bringing to the table and perhaps confronting them? Sure. I just want to say, uh, first off, that um, one of the things that we do differently in this comic than you see in, like I think, traditional superhero movies and, and comics is that normally in in those, those superhero stories, there's a, there is genuflection and sort of reflection about, well, is this the right thing to do? Or, you know, are we going too far? But then that's the setup. And then the end of the, the resolution is the fight. The, you know, they, they decide, well, we've got no choice. We've got to destroy this, this evil menace, usually an outsider coming to our planet from somewhere else, which I think just sort of, you know, plays into the, the general hysteria of, you know, paranoia, xenophobia of outsiders, Uh, no matter what the, the actual message of the, the story is. But we do it kind of the opposite way. We have a conflict. There is action. There is violence. But it's the reflection that happens after that about what were the consequences of this and did it really change anything that I think is what becomes the soul of, of this comic as opposed to traditional other traditional superhero comics where the action is kind of what you're hoping to get to and what, what the soul of it is. Um, but, but yeah, I, I feel like, like culturally we wanted to use somebody who people would instantly recognize and and i've already written two books about the bible so i felt like jesus was somebody i could write about sort of authoritatively and we wanted it to be sort of a jesus that people who go to mega churches and go to um normal um, american normal but you know american mainstream american churches would recognize from their prayer books and from the the stained glass inside the church so we try to sort of ride the line between doing a um culturally accurate and then just sort of like a, um, a historically ac accurate depiction of Christ. But we really wanted it first and foremost to be the Jesus Christ that they would recognize from their churches, which is why we went with the design we did. But because I, I think that a lot of the, um, the current push for, for violence for solutions or for thinking that the, the, all of our problems come from people 
from outsiders. Uh, I think that a lot of that those ideas are germinated in the mega churches and in the sort of like radical evangelical uh, churches that have taken over American Christianity. So I wanted them to have to reflect upon their own doctrine and their own theology uh, by by having it challenged by the Jesus Christ they recognize in the comic. And uh, we have some, some comments from the audience, and I want to uh, remind to the people who is watching in, in here, if you have some of the questions, they actually will be appearing uh, at the lower part of the screen. And uh, for example, from the night boy, uh, Richard Grayson, uh, he sounds familiar. He sounds from uh, another podcast, from the Stripando, perhaps. And he say uh, he's saying, I have to praise the research Mark did on the Bible. So far, the book seems very well documented. He's referring to second comic. Uh, the Bible is not so well uh, documented. No, I'm sorry. That's uh, my commentary. And uh, <laughs> yeah. another, uh, he has a question for you. And he's mentioned it. Uh, he's asking, uh, how hard was to set the tone and the rhythm for this book? That was really the 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 hard part that was the trick was just getting the tonality right so i didn't want it to just be so wacky that you couldn't take the the situation seriously but i didn't want to be grim and dark where it's just one depressing situation after another i wanted to be funny but i want to be funny in a very tragic sort of way so that was something that took a long time that's i think one of the the silver linings of having it shelved for so long by vertigo is that it gave us more time to keep refining the comic until we found the sensibility because it's really hard sometimes You find just the right balance when you're trying to do something serious uh, that's also funny. It's it's hard to find the balance between still taking it seriously and without it becoming a total farce. And uh, for example, you have some hard blows uh, even on uh, issue number two because uh, we have actually the consequences, something that we don't uh, really see in a lot of stories because... And actually, that's other of the points that you touch uh, brilliantly, I, I, I dare to say, on the second issue, because uh, we have some uh, sort of confrontation be between uh, two parts of the God, uh, Jesus and uh, Yahweh, or uh, Godfather and Godson, uh, if you if you wish. And uh, one of the comments that in this case uh, Jesus mentions is that, uh, well, you know, uh, my father is really fun to have, but he never, uh, he never remains to clean up. And we have this confrontation in one of the uh, regular situations for a superhero where he was, in this case, fighting uh, some robots, or at, at least uh, he thought that they were robots, but, they, but then you have the actual consequences. And then you have something that I believe it's um, underappreciated, uh, and it's the power of talking, because we actually see, in this case, uh, Sunstar, Uh, having some uh, group of, uh, some group group therapy where he can talk about these things. How did this idea came to your mind? Well, I wanted to show the consequences of, of, of the, the violent action because usually, like I mentioned before, that's that's the climax of the movie or the comic book. Mm -hmm. And the credits roll and the story ends once they've successfully you know, killed or beaten up whoever they were trying to like to defeat. But what I wanted to show is like, well, what about what happens after that? Especially because we're all working with sort of imperfect information. We're all working, even with the best of intentions. If you don't know the whole story, you might do things. You might commit to actions that in retrospect uh, were, were overreacting. And as is the case with Sunstar, destroying what he thought were robots, but just turned out to be guys in robot costumes. So now, now he has to live with the fact that he completely overreacted and murdered these guys Uh, who, uh, because he thought he was stopping a, a robot attack. So, so it's about, again, the futility of power, and that power is all sort of based upon this, this extremely finite amount of information that we have at the time we act, and about how you should use it very sparingly because of that reason alone. And I think that's also Christ's message to him, is that, like, you know, um, sure, I mean, mercy can make you look foolish. You can look like a sucker if you trust somebody or if you try to talk them out of doing the wrong thing. But in the end, it's probably better to be a sucker than an asshole, which is the danger you run into if you act first without knowing what you're doing, uh, in, in, which is precisely what, what Sunstar falls into. And it, it, is, it is egged on by, by God the Father, Yahweh, and just like, oh, no, just figure it out. Just, just act and do, be decisive and you know, let the ships fall where they may, which is very much his sort of philosophy as we see throughout the, the Old Testament. So it's like, just act and, you know, and... and do what you think is best and people are going to die regardless of whether or not you, you kill them or not. So just, just act as you would as if you were a God. Uh, but there are consequences to that, especially if you are trying to, uh, if you're, you're acting under the, the, the guise of helping people. Um, so 
and I, and I think that the dichotomy between Jesus Christ and God the Father is, is not something that I just sort of made up. It's something that exists in the canonical Bible and especially exists in the non-canonical uh, books ri- written by early Christian authors. And uh, the whole, the whole uh, Gnostic faith is bound around sort of explaining the dichotomy, like how can this, how can Jesus, who's this man who represents forgiveness and, you know, turning the other cheek and, um, and, and giving up the ways of the world, how can he be reconciled with God the Father, who's this guy who smites the wicked and passes all these laws and basically is the social order uh, of the world? And so that's, the, the I think, the central conundrum for a lot of early Christians. So I wanted to explore that, too. And, and, and I think that every good mythology, whether it's Christian or otherwise, is basically built upon a dysfunctional family you know, drama. And uh, you know, Greek mythology, that's basically all it is, is like, you know, these, these this dysfunctional family living on Mount Olympus, uh, interfering with human affairs in the way they see fit as, you know, as pawns in their, their greater chess game. So I wanted to explore that within the context of the, 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 the Christian story. And uh, it's on brilliant thing in here. And uh, I just want to uh, remind to the people who is actually reading the books, uh, I believe that every everyone who has uh, actually read any single copy, either issue one, issue two, issue three is coming uh, this month. Uh, you cannot complain. Uh, you, you you see somebody who actually understands the characters, who actually respects, and it's something that we mentioned in the previous uh, interview that we have, is uh, uh, the way that you're dealing with the characters uh, for some people can be uh, kind of tricky because you have a lot of respect. You are uh, playing uh but uh, with characters that are the basis of our religion and not only one religion but a, a lot of uh, different uh, versions of, of of the same belief however uh, believe me when i tell you that it's not uh, making fun of any of the characters which is not surprising if any of the people who are familiar with your work uh, we mentioned uh, your previous work with god is disappointed in you and apocrypha now uh, where uh, you actually uh, tell the story like if you were uh, understanding it and trying to tell it to to your friend in a way that it's actually understandable so uh, and one uh, final thing remember that as um, mark mentioned uh, the letters uh, can be fine uh, uh, can be found at the end of every issue hopefully we will see more of this and uh, the response so far have been great or at least that's the way that it looks yeah, yeah, uh, I've been really happy with the response and, and uh, the way readers are. And, and I've had conversations, too, with people on uh, Twitter who've come to me very respectfully and saying, well, you know, this this sounds incredibly blasphemous and it sounds like something I will not enjoy at all, but I just want to know what you're getting at. And I can, mm-hmm. and I, and I was tell them, like, well, this is where I'm coming from and what I'm trying to say with it. And they still might not be on board with what I'm doing, but at least, think at least the, they're nine times out of ten capable of understanding it and we can walk away with mutual respect for each other even if we don't agree exactly and then, after all the, the the basis of every conversation is understanding or at least uh, taking some time to listen to the other to 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 check his uh, point of view so don't worry right now for the second part of, the, of this conversation we're going to talk not about uh, figures that might be controversial but actually one comic that for me was a great surprise well, it wasn't a surprise because you have worked before with Dynamite, uh, with the Lone Ranger, if, if I'm not mistaken. And I really love the, 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 the run that you have in there. And when I heard that you were going to write about Red Sonja, uh, for me it was like, okay, sounds great. Uh, what is the... Can you tell us about the pitch, perhaps, that you had for this character, in uh, for Red Sonja, for Dynamite? Well, I was drawn to Red Sonja because they were willing to let me do uh, a longer arc like 24, 25 issues, which is longer than I've ever been able to write a story before. And, but also because it allows me to draw upon one of my great interests, uh, which is ancient history. I am taking a lot of like sort of stories or things from like the histories of Rhodotus and from the Jewish Midrash and putting these details into Red Sonia to sort of flesh out that world and to flesh out uh, the story, which I find enormously gratifying as a writer and, and I think they they enjoy it too because it gives her a dimension that perhaps she hasn't had in other other runs. It's more, it makes to me the the fantasy that I always really love uh, things like like Lord of the Rings or um, or Game of Thrones are fantasy stories that take the time to sort of develop the world in which they exist. They exist in a very 
understandable, if magical, but understandable world because they've taken the time to think about the rules by which this world operates. And not only that, but to create like belief systems for the people that are in this world and have in the world. It makes it feel more than just like a normal sort of like matinee sword and sandal story where it's just kind of like some wizards and some 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 dudes with swords fighting for two hours. The fact that they've actually taken the time to create this world. And so the fact that they were giving me the freedom to try to do that myself, I just found that impossible to pass up as a writer. I, I really uh, wanted to write this title the way the way I have, and they've been very good about letting me do that. And uh, it, it's really great. And for example, in case that, um, well, at the beginning, we were looking at some of the characteristic uh, uh, physical appearance of Red Sonia, which we all know the, the very light armor that she's always wearing and obviously with the sword. However, uh, you come from the very first issue when uh, you set a new status quo for her, something that perhaps has been touching in previous stories, but something that actually in here uh, helps us to, to understand more about the world that it's taking uh, where, where the story is taking place and you start uh, actually uh, with her not as a warrior but actually when she's been named the queen and uh, can you tell us a little bit uh, where did you get the inspiration in this case for her uh, for for her change of status quo yeah i wanted her to uh i needed a story for how she becomes queen mm -hmm. and i thought it'd be good if she basically just her her career trajectory just went from like zero to 60 in like five seconds so I introduce her as a, a refugee, basically. She's fleeing Katai in this uh, sort of palace coup that she that that um, destroyed her mentor. And and she's fleeing that. And then as soon as she comes into her economy and not knowing what to find, they just sort of weirdly make her queen. And she can't figure out why they would even do this, why they would make her queen, until, it, until she finds out that whoever's queen runs the risk of, you know, has to basically answer back to Dragon the Magnificent, this this uh, emperor who controls half the world. And if you give the wrong answer, then he seals you in a sack with live scorpions and rats and a goat and throws you into the river of blood. So it wasn't because they really believed in her or, or, or thought she'd make a great queen. It was more like nobody else wanted to take the responsibility of dealing with this guy. So they just named her queen so they could split town and leave her holding the bag, as it were. And uh, some of the aspects that, uh, well, one of the ways that fiction helps us a lot to, is to, uh, we, we can deal with uh, problems or situations that we might have in the real world, but uh, we perhaps are not allowed to mention them directly. Or for the reader, in this case, it will be a little bit harder. And you actually are dealing also with some uh, socio-political problems in here. We're looking at uh, one of the maps where we see the confrontation of the characters that we were mentioned. Uh, in this case, Red Sun, yeah, is the, the, the leader of the, in this case, the new qu appointed queen of the one of the few uh, freelance and then we have the oppressor the, the the king that only wants to to take this uh pretty much own the world based on a prophecy because uh, as soon as he uh stop uh, gaining more territory well pretty much his his kingdom will come to an end and his life will come to an end uh can you tell us a, a bit about the research that you did for the developing in this case these kind of characters because i see some reference perhaps of uh previous uh, emperors perhaps but uh, i will uh, love to to know the specific reference that perhaps you took yeah it's very loosely but generally based upon the story of king cyrus the great of uh, persia and um and the the his invasion of uh queen of the Massagetai, uh led by queen tamyris who were uh scythians who lived uh in northern iran uh southern russia and he uh, basically was the most powerful man in the world, uh, had knocked off like, you know, the, um, the Assyrians and the Babylonians, and it basically was just an a, a empire conqueror, it, I mean, a conqueror of other empires. And then he makes war on this like backward sort of like um, steps tribe, and they run him ragged. They sent him on this wild goose chase around the, uh, the Russian steppes. They burn their fields so he can't feed his horses or his men and end up killing him. So in a way, it's this sort of like curious story in uh, in world history where the most powerful man in the world is not only defeated, but killed by this rebel queen who, you know, leads like a tribe of some of the least sophisticated, you know, poorest people that, you know, in, in the ancient world. 
And so I wanted to sort of tell that story about how sort of weakness is its own sort of form of strength. The fact that you are not leading this empire, you don't have all these different factions and you don't, and you're just fighting for your basic survival. How, and you're willing, you're able, because you have nothing to lose, you're, you have, there's nothing that you can't really sacrifice. How that really is itself what, what leads her to, to be victorious over Dragon. And uh, the way that, uh, in this case, Red Sonia is uh, taking care of the situation because she's, uh, from the very beginning, put in a very difficult uh, problem. It's it's something that I really love about the writing. Well, it's a characteristic that you have in pretty much all these stories because the dialogues are really clever. And the way that, uh, in this case, uh, she uh, is fixing or um, confronting every situation is more based on wit and not exactly on, on, on the power. We saw in the map that the, the forces that she has under her control or the people that it's supposed to be helping her in, in the kingdom, uh, it's not a lot. But for example, she's playing one of the of the cards uh, very smartly, where she's actually uh, playing, in this case, the emperor uh, and uh, appealing to his ego. And for example, this is one of the... Uh, I, I'm, I'm, I'm going to read part of the dialogue, sorry if my pronunciation is, is not the best. But for example, she is confronting the most powerful person that it's at that time in the world, and she's mentioning that uh, he has conquered half the world and all it's accomplished is to make uh, make him a servant of expectations. So at, at the very end, uh, the most powerful uh, person in, in these realms is pretty much a slave. A slave of uh, perhaps not of another kingdom, but a slave uh, nonetheless. And uh, after this, we have some, some other char characters that are introduced, and uh, I'm going to, to mention one uh, that appears in, uh, in the regular story, and actually uh, takes, uh, we know uh, about his origins on the one shot, uh, Red Sonja, Lord of Fools, and can you tell us a little bit about the Tongue of Fire, which I believe it's, uh, I, I couldn't avoid to read his dialogues with your voice, because uh, he seemed like the voice of reason, and it was like, uh, perhaps this is actually the voice of Mark. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I, I, I wish, I wish I was the voice of reason. Uh, in my experience, nobody who calls themselves the voice of reason really is, uh, but <laughs> but I, I'll take that, I'll take that role. <laughs> Okay, so can you tell us a little bit about the one-shot uh, Lord of Fools, where we are exploring? This is uh, an issue that is between, I believe, issues six and seven. It's like a, a brief pause along the, the 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 rest of the story. However, it helps us to get uh, to gain a different perspective about, in this case, the family of of the emperor. So, what else? Uh, what other details are we finding in this in this case in the kingdoms? Can you tell us a little bit about that, uh, Mark? Yeah. So Lord of Fools actually takes place almost entirely in uh, the, the royal palace in Zamora mm. uh, while Dragon is away on his, on, on his war against Hyrcania. And what it's about is about how he, the most powerful man in the world, is himself uh, being sent on a fool's errand because this evil curse that he must always be conquering new lands or he will die, it was just made up. It was just fabricated by the Oricon, who's sort of like the high priest there. Because unbeknownst to Dragon, he's having an affair with Dragon's wife, the Empress. And he just wanted Dragon to be anywhere else so he could continue his love affair with, with the wife. And that, that is reason and and he sort of understands the gravity of this by making this sort of, you know, false prophecy. He's condemned half the world to being conquered by Dragon the Magnificent. So in a way it's kind of about how all of our sort of personal interests and all of our plans are futile because they all end up having these massive consequences that, that we did not ourselves intend, including the Oricon, who's the spokesman of this religion. He just wanted to get rid of Dragon, get him out the door. He figured that if he made this prophecy that he always had to be conquering land, sooner or later somebody would kill him and he would, they would be done with him. But he just keeps winning. He keeps winning these wars against these other kingdoms and keeps growing more powerful. So the Oricon has to deal with the idea that he is basically – taken this guy who he hates and is like arch rival and made him the most powerful man in the world by virtue of this evil prophecy that he, he bestowed upon him. So it really is about, again, sort of like the, the futility of plans and, and, and power. Uh, and the, uh, the, the Oricon and the Empress both worship the same God who is the Lord of Fools, who is in charge of all, you know, oversees all human activity and is the lowest ranking god in the heavens. And basically that's his position, that all human activity is futility. And I love that. Oh, go ahead. No, no, sorry. 
that that human activity is not even worth bothering the greater gods about. Like the Lord of Fools is the is is just the lowest on the totem pole, and he's the only one who can even be bothered to care about human affairs because they're so insignificant in the grand scheme of things. Yeah, and in this case, if you are watching this on, on, on video, uh, you will see some of the, of the inner pages, some of the representations, so you can have actually the image of uh, how the, in this case, how the, the, the rest of the gods, of the rest of the personalities are interlocked. But once again, we're playing, in this case, with uh, some person, some, 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 some character who is a slave, in this case, of expectations, and another one uh, who is actually a slave of the consequences of the of his wishes where he actually wanted just to get rid of, of one of the characters but at the very end uh, you ended uh, with the, in a full serum because uh, well uh, the quest is not going to finish is gonna not going to end the way that he was uh, looking to so I just want to take a moment to uh, to give a shout out to that artwork uh, Bob Q's like artwork on the Lord of Fools like as you see there, the gods, it's so phenomenal. And Deerbla's coloring is just, was just, it blew me away when I saw that. I thought that, I couldn't have envisioned something better than that. It's, it's so good. Yeah, and uh, yes, because comics is a collaborative me uh, medium and and uh, the, 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 the teams that you have been working with, uh, it, the, the, the art, it's uh, it's really wonderful. And obviously it helps, it, it, it complements the story because after all, well, it's a comic, so we have to have pictures and we have to have words uh, as we were uh, as we are reading them. So uh, this is something that has been uh, published. Uh, those are pretty much my recommendations. If you haven't read second comic, if you haven't read Red Sonia, uh, in the case of Red Sonia, don't worry, I, I recommend you to pick the this one shot and uh, you will get pretty much uh, a good panorama. However, it's not the only things that uh, you are working uh, with right now. Uh, there is a comic that is going to be released tomorrow, actually, um, and it's The Wonder Twins. I, I love the run that you are having, and I was really glad when they announced that it, it was going to be no, no, not only a, ser a series of uh, just six issues, but it actually is going to be the double of that. Is that correct? <laughs> That's right. Yeah, I, I couldn't be happier because it's been so much fun writing the Wonder Twins. And so and I, there were a lot of little stories I wasn't able to work into the first six, six issues. So getting the chance to revisit some of those and work them into the bigger arc is really great. So yeah, we're doing another six issues, uh, 7 through 12. And um, and the first one deals with a, uh, with, with a superhero who um, his power is basically just that he smells really bad, <laughs> which makes him the loneliest superhero on the planet. Cause they have to keep him in this sort of hermetically sealed bunker where he lives alone and he does no human contact except for when they need him to come out to sort of uh, dispel brightest crowds or things. And to, to make the tragedy even more complete, he's like this really nice guy. He's a really sweet person who's starving for human contact he can't have by virtue of a superpower, which I think in a lot of ways stands as a metaphor for superheroes in general because they are they're isolated by the nature of the work they do and what you know what that does to a person's psyche. <laughs> yeah. And uh, for example, some of the other aspects that are really interesting in this comic book is that you also establish and give humanity to some characters that in, in this case are uh, are the villains and we were looking uh, at some of the pages of the preview and uh can you tell us a little bit about some of these uh second third tier i don't know uh, said class villains because they're like at the lower at the bottom of the of, of the chain however they are really interesting and they are like really human uh, and you introduce them in this case in, in the wonder twins can you tell us a little bit about them yeah i don't even really consider those to be villains so much well, as they're just people who don't yeah. buy into this sort of binary moral uh, construct of, of good and evil. And they're, they're, they see themselves as people who are just willing to do what the quote unquote heroes are not in order to fix the world. Uh, so, I mean, there clearly are villains in the DC universe, people who are just irredeemable and beyond the pale, you know, evil that must be stopped at all costs. But the villains I try to introduce in this series, people like the Scrambler, or like polymath or um, and, you know some of the other villains a lot of them are, are just people who um, have a very strong opinion and a very distinct perspective and um, and are just willing to do things that are outside the uh, the coloring book for the uh, for the Justice League and so they're not bad people so much as they're just um, 
they're just using their power in unorthodox ways. <laughs> unorthodox, I, I love that uh, way to portray them. Well, um, uh, pretty much, uh, as we mentioned, that will be actually the recommendation for this week. And I, I have been enjoying a lot the Wonder Twins. We had the chance to talk about this title in, in a previous interview. And uh, as I mentioned before, I'm really glad that it, it is going to double his life. And uh, that's not the only comic. Uh, we will get the release of the third issue uh, by Ahoy Comics of Second Coming. Uh, second uh, Coming... Uh, one question, is it going to be a limited series or is it going to be ongoing as... Uh... No, originally it was going to be a, a, a limited series with Vertigo and mm -hmm. I, I had every reason to believe they're going to let the first six, six issues go and then just sort of like let me quietly disappear and, <laughs> and, and never... But Ahoy uh, loves the, the, the series and how it's doing so uh, we're going to go for a much longer run. It's probably going to be around for, I'm, I'm guessing, 24 to 30 issues. Ah, oh, wonderful! And actually, oh, no. it's uh, we ha when we had the, ch to, the chance to what with uh, the to talk with uh, Tom Payer, he mentioned that he rather uh, he, he rather work in a season uh, scheme because that way perhaps you you have the first arc with six issues, then you release the trade paperback, so you're you're still a little bit, and then you you give time so the, the, to, to prepare the next story. But actually, you can uh, get the numbers higher in the case of the sales of this. So I really love the fact that uh, it seems that you have a long uh, a long plan for these men yeah yeah there's a lot of story in here that I, i wasn't able to get in the first six issues and so yeah i have a, about i'm thinking 24 to 30 issues of of a good story um and yeah richard pace is going to be on board for as long as he can handle it for as long until mm -hmm. i drive him crazy <laughs> and so uh yeah no it's it's looking really good and yeah they're going to give us a month break after issue six and then it's right back to for a second coming Excellent. So there you have it. And in case that people want to contact you, perhaps want to uh, write you nice things about your work or perhaps an honest <laughs> review, I don't know. Uh, they can find yeah. you in, in uh, those uh, social networks, right? They can find you at Twitter. Yeah. And uh, there you That's are. The best way. That's the best way to get a hold of me right there is by Twitter. I'm on Twitter more than I am any other so social media. So follow me at Manris. Um, And uh, yeah, if, if you if you have a question, you can just message me there or hit me up. Uh, if you and if it's if you're respectful, I'll even answer it. <laughs> there you have it. So please uh, treat him with the respect that you uh, want to receive. Uh, you have you find him really easily in Twitter as uh, Manrus with double S uh, at the end. And uh, pretty much that's every everything that we have in this case for uh, for this uh, conversation. Mark, thank you very much for your time. I really enjoyed talking with you, man. Uh, thank you, Dan. It's been great. All right, and thank you to everybody who is watching this uh, conversation. I uh, remind you that tomorrow will be available in the audio downloadable version and also will be available in the rest of the channel like Facebook, uh, Periscope, and YouTube. So far, uh, we have uh, been having a great uh, tracking with uh, these interviews and hopefully we will have Mark in, in the near future with talking uh, so we can talk about another comic or perhaps about the final of second coming, uh, perhaps the coming of the third coming. I don't know, something else. <laughs> Third coming. All right, thank you very much. Yeah, great. And, and hopefully we will do it. And thanks to all the patrons that are supporting this show. And actually, you are going to see his names, uh, their names, on the end credits uh, while, we, while we are finishing this transmission. <laughs>